passing an offering plate because of uh, recommendations on the COVID restrictions. So the offering plates are still in the window. You can drop your offerings there after after the service. The little brown bowl, I think, is for the ADRA projects that the kids support. Uh, thank you for remembering those. If I had any other announcements I was supposed to make. If not this week, we, we've done better than usual. So, join us in Revelation chapter 14 today. Let's all open our Bibles. We're going to be looking at what's called the third angel's message from Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. I want to read that passage with you. And we look at some Old Testament parallel passages and I think John may actually have had in mind when he wrote these words down. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 12 reads like this. The third angel followed them, followed the first two angels that we've studied in the last month. Followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, to worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's not exactly the easiest text to land on for a Sabbath morning. It's a horrific warning to think of the wrath of God being poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and that that wrath should fall on people is a warning that uh, I don't think you'll find a parallel for it really any place else in scripture. It's extreme. It's a, a topic that could bear some mulling over in our minds. It's, you know, the scripture calls what God accomplishes in that, in that work of pouring out his wrath as being uh, unlike him. It's just a strange work for God, isn't it, to punish. Because God is merciful, God's long-suffering, but God's also just. And this third angel's message deals with that and says that eventually God has to deal with the issue of sin. And he encourages and pleads with people, don't be, don't be found in the camp that has to receive God's punishment. That's the essence of the third angel's message that we're going to look at today. It boils down to a choice that individuals need to make on where they stand in these last days. Um, but I did, I noticed some things this week I thought were kind of interesting that I wanted to um, look up with you. A lot of the language in Revelation is borrowed from the Old Testament. Um, it seems like John must have been an avid student of Scripture, and he also was inspired of the Holy Spirit, obviously, in writing the Revelation. But uh, this idea of God having a cup of wrath is one that shows up in several places in the Old Testament. Look at Psalm 75 with me. I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. This it tells us that God is the judge. I was, in studying this this week, I was awfully comforted with that idea that God is the judge. You know, we live in a, a day and age where we're not even really sure what reality is sometimes. You know, even in the midst of this pandemic, there's things that just don't make a whole lot of sense. But you, you get to thinking about it, and it's like, 
there's probably some kind of an underlying agenda uh, that's being pushed using the pandemic as a tool to accomplish some other means. There's just there's things that don't make a lot of sense to us. And we know we live in a world that's unjust to the core. I mean, criminals go free. Good people end up in jail. Bad things happen to the righteous. Uh, justice is not always served, is it? But God is eventually going to be the judge. That's also found in the three angels' messages. You know, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. It's a comforting thought to me that God, a righteous God, is going to be our judge eventually. He puts one down and he sets up another and it says for the hand of the Lord for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup and the wine is red it's full of mixture and he pours out the same but the dregs thereof all the wicked of the earth shall bring them out and drink them but I'll declare forever I'll sing praises to the God of Jacob. David knew that there's a strange work that God accomplishes that there's a, a cup in his hand that's filled with a just wrath that will eventually be poured out, be poured out on the wicked. Isaiah 51, verse 17, tells us something singular. I want you to see this text with me, and we'll look at another one in Jeremiah, a little more extensive passage I want to read with you. But Isaiah chapter 51, uh, verse 17. Both this passage in Isaiah and the passage we're going to look at in Jeremiah carry kind of an interesting thought to me. Uh, particularly the one in Jeremiah shows that God's people are not immune from drinking from that cup. You know, this passage in Isaiah, he's talking about how that cup was actually something that Jerusalem, God's Jewish people, had to partake of. And I expect that it's going to be the same as we approach the second coming of Jesus, that there is some refining that needs done amongst God's people, that there's some sins that need uh, taken away from us, that there's some punishment that needs done in the midst of God's people. And I think he'll do that for his folks to wake them up. Uh, but eventually, in both of these passages, Isaiah goes on and you have judgments against Babylon, also in Jeremiah's passage. Uh, eventually, the cup is drained by the wicked, but God's people partake somewhat of that punishing as well. I think we found that when we looked at the story of the plagues in Egypt. How many plagues fell on Egypt? Ten. There was ten plagues. God's people got to partake of the first three with the Egyptians. There is a, there's a work that needs done on God's people. It's not like we're paying for our sins. Jesus paid for our sins. But God is separating our affections from this world and allowing his people to experience hard times. Um, verse 17 in Isaiah 51. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, speaking to God's people, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury, You've drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling. You've wrung them out. Definitely speaking of a cup of punishment that God's people have partaken of. In Jeremiah chapter 25, let's pick that passage up. Look at it. We're going to start reading in verse 11. Uh, God's talking about how this cup's going to be drunk by Babylon and by the surrounding nations in this passage. He said, this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. That was the punishment of God's people. And it shall come to pass when the 70 years are accomplished that I'll punish the king of Babylon. And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolation. I'll bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that's written in the book which Jeremiah had prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves to them also, and I'll recompense them according to their deeds. 
and according to the works of their own hands. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink, and be moved, and be mad, because of the sword that I'll send among them. Jeremiah says, Then he took the cup at the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to drink upon whom the Lord had sent me. There was Jerusalem, the cities of Judah, the kings thereof, the princes thereof, to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing, a curse, as it is this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, all the mingled people, and he goes on and lists, and he says, all the nations, all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the deserts will drink of it, all the kings of the north. Therefore, says the Lord, in verse 27, the God of Israel, drink ye and be drunken, spew and fall, rise no more because of the sword which I'll send among you. Then God says, and it shall be, if they won't drink this cup, assure them that they will indeed. Since they won't drink it in Jeremiah's hand, God's going to accomplish the work against the wicked inhabitants of the earth. This cup of God's judgment is not a foreign concept scripturally. It's in the Old Testament. It's in Revelation. God's a God of justice. And it's coming. We see that coming on the world. And we've been warned in Revelation chapter 14, don't be partaking of that cup. There's two groups of people in that passage, in the third angel's message, and they're contrasted. You have those that receive the mark of the beast, that partake of that, that worship his image or worship the beast, and in verse 12, you have those that are patient saints, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. A choice needs to be made. What, what do you want to do? Where do you want to stand? With the faith of Jesus, keeping the commandments of God? Or are you willing to compromise with his power? his image and receive that mark and partake of that cup of God's wrath. And studying this out, I thought, you know, there's a there's a lot to this passage that's probably not the simplest for people to understand. I mean, what is the beast? What's his image? What's his mark? Is it the mark of the beast? Is it an image to the beast? You know what? What's the issue for the Christian in this? I thought it might do us well to go back and just look at this whole whole uh, vision sequence in Revelation. It really starts at the end of chapter 11. You have this particular part of John's vision uh, recorded. And it starts with John seeing the temple of God opened in heaven, and he sees the Ark of the Testament in the temple. Okay? proceeds past that, and it introduces to us a series of images. You have the beast in chapter 13 that comes out of the sea that has seven heads and ten horns upon his horns. I'm, I'm blowing right past chapter 12. Chapter 12 talks about the dragon. Actually, we should probably, we should comment on it a little bit. We've got too much material. But chapter 12, we're told that the dragon is Satan, that old serpent, the devil, okay? Now the dragon is going to give, Satan is going to give his power to a beast that ascends out of the sea. Revelation tells us that the sea in prophecy is peoples, nations. This beast comes up in a, in a populous area. And this beast in Revelation 13, the first beast there, is like unto a leopard. He has the feet of a bear, he has the mouth of a lion. The dragon, that old serpent, the devil, gives him his power. Okay. He's a composite looking beast, and it should remind you a little bit of a, a prophecy in Daniel that uses the same animals that this beast resembles. This beast has a head that's wounded unto death, and his deadly wound is healed. All the world wanders after the beast. It's a beast that accepts worship in verse 4. Uh, it's a beast that makes war against the saints. It's a beast that has a time prophecy associated with his reign. Uh, 
it's a beast that Protestant believers have forever uh, associated with the papacy. It's a beast that I don't think you can identify it with anything else. I was thinking of how many times that particular time prophecy shows up in scripture today. Uh, wrote these down this morning and I may have missed some but Daniel 7 Verse 25, the same beast is described as reigning for a time, times, and half a time. Uh, Revelation 12, 14 describes it the same way. Prophetically, that ends up being 1260 days. 1260 day prophecy. Revelation 13, 5 has it as 42 months. Revelation 11, 2 has it as 42 months. Revelation 12, 6 shows it as 1260 prophetic days, which in prophecy, a day equals a year. This power is going to last a long, long time, and it persecutes God's people. Protestants appointed to the papacy forever as being a fulfillment of that. The image to his beast, though, is set up by another beast in Revelation that's got kind of a different track record all the way around. Uh, <clears throat> you look at his story, he shows up from a different location, verse 11. He's a beast that comes up out of the earth. He has two horns like a lamb. He speaks like a dragon, though. He's got the devil's tongue. He exercises all the power of the first beast, and it's this second beast that forms an image and asks all the world to worship the first beast. It gives power to the image that... Um, so that the image could both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead that no man might buy or sell. Save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. That beast prophetically meets its fulfillment comes up at the right time historically, comes up as the first beast in Revelation 13 and is reaching a low point in his career. His 1260 year reign ends in 1798. The United States is rising to prominence at that time. Uh, it's a beast that comes up uh, differently than the others because it comes up out of the earth a largely unpopulated area. It's uh, got lamb-like qualities. I think it's a very apt picture of the United States, but it's a disturbing picture because it says it ends up speaking like a dragon. It ends up enforcing worship of that first beast, the one that, the, that Satan gave the power to, the papacy. I remember having a study with an attorney friend. God was really kind of strong on the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights, and we've been having a, a good series of Bible studies, enjoying our time together. But when we got to this passage in Revelation, he just he blew it off and said, "There's no way the United States would ever be party to setting up an image to this first beast." And he recognized that beast as a papacy. And I think he even intellectually had to recognize the second beast in Revelation 13 as being the United States. But he just couldn't conceive of the United States setting up an image to the first beast, to the papacy. I'd kind of like to talk to him now and ask if maybe he can see it. Because like Dad mentioned in our prayer time, I'm seeing all kinds of calls now for Sunday worship because of this pandemic. I, I watched a couple videos this week and I want to share to you some information and give credit where I got it uh, on these and, and suggest strongly that you guys look them up and watch them yourselves, okay? One of them is a series of lectures by Walter Weiss called What's Up Prof? that uh, been going on for some time. It's out of South Africa, but 
he's got one this week that he put out that uh, asked, what's the agenda? Okay, I found the first 40 minutes of it dreadfully boring, because my wife has been really actively involved in this coronavirus pandemic thing, even working for the state now, and tracking uh, cases and contacts. So we've been, we've been pretty up on the news about coronavirus. But uh, Fife was pointing out some of the strange things you see in the midst of this and how it's being used to further another agenda and asking what is the agenda behind it. He pointed out some things that uh, are happening globally, some of them in the United States, and they're each well documented. It wasn't, these are not hearsay. He actually gave you a screenshot with the, the internet, what do you call it, a URL address. You can look them up, each one of these screenshots he gave you, the whole page is there. I paused and read them, looked them over, and I wanted to share some of these with you just to get you an idea of part of what the underlying agenda is of what's going on in our world right now. What's going on is a push for Sunday legislation for Sunday months. And people are clamoring for it. I was kind of surprised at that. Now, uh, even in our own country, I've, I've heard a call for that. But these were the examples he gave. I didn't write the addresses down, but you can sure go look on that site and read them for yourself. It's pretty interesting. Poland started the push for Sunday laws uh, earlier than the rest of the nations in our world. Okay? I think it was about 2015, actually, that Poland initially enacted a Sunday law. And they did it incrementally. And it's still progressing incrementally. Okay, in 2019, Poland closes all the businesses except for really essential services on Sunday for 37 Sundays. Okay, in 2020, it's 45 Sundays. And it goes until, I think it's in 2024, everything is closed on Sunday except for the Sunday before Christmas. They let you have a, a shopping day, I guess, or whatever. But it's an incremental approach to a Sunday law. But a legislated closure of businesses on Sunday. Puerto Rico, which you know, kind of surprised me. Puerto Rico's got a real strong Sunday law right now. Uh, if you violate it, if you insist on keeping your business open, Puerto Rico now, you get six months of prison time up to $5,000 fine. Uh, you don't drive a car in Puerto Rico on Sunday unless it's an emergency. If you're taking somebody to a hospital. Or... Slovenia has a Sunday law now. It was really pushed by the trade unions in Slovenia. Uh, a strict Sunday law. Croatia has one. The Philippines started out in Santo City in the Philippines, and that was a total Sunday closure. Philippines, you kind of expect that, wouldn't you? It's a strongly Catholic nation. The Cayman Islands is an interesting one, uh, interested me. They have a curfew system in the Cayman Islands now. I think it's from 8 o'clock at night until the next morning. Nobody's to be out. They don't, you know, too much socializing happens at night. And they call that a soft curfew. If you violate the SOC curfew, you could be fined $1,000. And they say you could get six months in prison in the Cayman Islands. But Sunday is a hard curfew. If you're caught out on Sunday, it's a $3,000 fine and a year in prison. These are the kind of things in the midst of a pandemic. Does this make any sense to you at all? Does the virus know what day of the week it is? You know, why didn't they, if you want to eliminate transmission by 1 7th, why didn't they choose a Wednesday? A Tuesday. But it's always Sunday that keeps showing up. You know, Sunday is the day that's set aside in people's minds as being a day to get back to God. To be in, a lot of people just flat call it the Lord's Day. It's not the day that Jesus called against. And he said that he's Lord of the Sabbath. 
the seventh day of the week was his day. But Sunday's the day they set aside to shut businesses down. Cyprus, I thought Cyprus was at least a pleasant uh, surprise. The people of Cyprus are up in arms over the Sunday closures. And they're pointing out the inconsistencies, especially in closing down the grocery stores. They had a protest in Cyprus because, you know, if you can't shop on Sunday, that just means it's going to be twice as many people in the store on Monday. You know, so what's it do to alleviate the spread of the coronavirus? It's but Sunday has been singled out again as a day that businesses are not to be open. Greece, the supermarkets are closed. Pharmacies are even closed on Sundays. Uh, trade unions behind that a big way to give people a break. Belize, a complete shutdown on Sundays. Peru had a unique take on it. I like Peru's idea. Now Panama has followed. Liked it in quotes. But in Peru, if you're a man, you can be out on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's your days to shop. If you're a woman, you can be out on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. You can be out and around town. That's how they're quarantining people. But notice one day that nobody's out. And what's the day again? It's Sunday. It's always Sunday that they're picking on. On Sunday, no one... No one's to be out and about. Uh, and in a lot of these, people are asserting that part of the reason that we're experiencing a pandemic is that this is a judgment at God's hand for having ignored his Sabbath. And they call that Sabbath Sunday. You know, our, our governor in New Jersey is He's one in the United States that's been making noises like that. He wanted businesses closed on the Sabbath, which to him was Sunday. The assertion that God's judgments are visited upon men for the violation of this Sunday Sabbath is something that uh, was predicted in the Great Controversy, that that would be something that people would put out, that judgments come on the land because people ignore God and his claims. I don't know. I think you can see it coming. And then today and tomorrow, there'll be a lot of people in church you know, praising our own government for having made a stand and deciding that uh, you know it's essential that Christians should be in church. That was our president yesterday, wasn't it? You go online and look a little bit, you actually think this may have been in a, um, what is the little guy's name? Preacher Betty Carolyn introduced me to him and watched him off and on since Francine just bought some. Scott Ritzma. Yeah, Scott Ritzma, 11th Hour Dispatch. He had some footage from our own Congress that was pretty, pretty interesting. I forgot what state it was, but we got a senator or a representative testifying in Congress that every Christian, that every American should be in a, in a church on Sunday, she specifically said, you know, praying that this thing pass. And we're not that far from the things that we've seen predicted for us. Uh, I think at the same time that the world is moving in that direction 100%, our own church is basically sound asleep on it. And that really kind of freaks me out. How when prophecy is being fulfilled can people just be so unconcerned about it? You know, making so little preparation to get ready. I wanted to challenge you today a little bit um, to to do some serious thinking about where you stand in your relationship with Jesus Christ and where you stand in your relationship with his commandments. <clears throat> you know, if someone tells you that you're not to worship on the seventh day Sabbath, does it mean that much to you to do things God's way? Is it just something that you can say, hey, you know, I mean, what's the difference? Sabbath, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, who cares? I mean, I'm worshiping. I want you to ask yourself the question, how particular is God on 
things that he sets aside as being important to him. You know, did he really care what tree you ate out of in the garden? Is that something specific to him? We talked about it last week. Did he care about what kind of fire he had in a body to put in their little sensors? God is extremely particular about some things. They're a test of loyalty. Where is your loyalty? Would you stand on God's side even if your government, uh, if your friends and neighbors said that you know, you're know you being an absolute fool? I mean, what difference does it make? What if there was a penalty for being here on Sabbath? What if there was a penalty for not being in church tomorrow morning someplace else in this town? You know, where do you stand on that? How serious are you about your walk with God? How clear are you on what these Bible prophecies point to? Do you know who the dragon is? Can you, can you show it from Scripture? Have you seen it there in Revelation chapter 12? Are you rock solid on who that beast is that's going to demand worship? Do you have an idea what his image is? You know, these things need to be ingrained in your head to where there's no question where you'll stand in your own thinking, in your own life. I saw there's a passage in Rebel in Isaiah chapter 34 that I really like. And I want to leave this with you as a challenge today. It's verse 16 of Isaiah 34. And I got into this. Uh, that's neither here nor there, but I started reading it about Isaiah 25 and what's called. Uh, the little apocalypse, because a lot of this passage of Isaiah reads like the book of Revelation. It's a good, interesting read. It's Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16, you got this advice. I think we do well to heed. It said, Seek ye out the book of the Lord, okay, and read. Seek ye out the book of the Lord, and read. No one of these shall fail, God says. This is on the end of a whole string of prophecies. And God says, seek out the book. Read it. Figure out what it says because that's, it's actually going to take place the way God says. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. None of these shall fail. Okay. That's my challenge for you today. Um, seek it out. Spend some time in this book. You got time that you can do other things. I mean, video games, TV, whatever else occupies our time. Facebook. I can't believe how much time social media burns up even for me. I'll pick that stupid thing up and just go to check what my friends are doing and an hour can get away from me in no time. Spend it instead in the Word of God. Figure out where you stand. Because friends, we're approaching the second coming of Jesus. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Get a grasp of what's coming. Make up your mind where you're going to stand. Because time's short. Okay? My recommendations for things for you to watch, definitely look up that Walter Bythe. It's the, the name of the program. It's out of South Africa, but it's called What's Up Prof, as in like professor. What's Up Prof. It's a bald-headed South African guy interviewing another South African. Uh, an excellent, excellent series there, actually. He has a couple of them. Is this the end? That would be worth watching. I think Rhonda's been recommending that one on her Facebook account. It's very good. Uh, this one was like maybe seven days old now, but it's entitled, What's the Agenda? Uh, very interesting. He's got other references there that you know you might might appeal to you more than they did to me. I just wrote down a list of some of the ones that jumped out at me. But interesting how the Sunday law is already uh, making its way into our world. Um, watch the news. I think you wouldn't watch very long before you find it being being pushed in our own country. I've noticed it several times recently. 
I'm going to start trying to document those a little bit, write them down when I hear them. Because I, I tend not to track things that, that well, but it's definitely coming to the forefront. Uh, as for myself, I'd rather be found on the side of worshiping God in His way. You know, if, if God says that this day is important to Him, it's important to me. Important enough to make a stand on. I hope that's the case for each of us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we spend a little bit of time looking at some things from your word and from the news. And I, in a lot of ways, it's just encouraging good news all the way around that we're getting closer to the second coming of Jesus. We thank you for that. Things I look forward to in that are getting to see my mom again, to uh, being in a world that just doesn't have sin and suffering anymore where people aren't getting sick not having prayer times where we've lost brothers and loved ones. We just look forward to the second coming of Jesus. Do know that before that happens, there's going to be a time of trouble in our world that will just be stunning in its magnitude. And I'd ask that uh, you'd help us be prepared for it. To, to have the faith of Jesus, to be found with people that keep his commandments, that do things the Lord's way because we love Him. We ask that His love just be growing in each of our hearts in Jesus' name.